Hey, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here today. Thank you for coming, uh, whether you're with us uh, by live stream or you're actually here at the East Bay Media Center in Berkeley. It's all the same. Thank you guys for coming instead of staying home and watching us on the internet. We really appreciate that. Uh, you don't have to go to Vegas to find red velvet cake. It can show up in your life pretty much anywhere. And when it does, you have to make a decision about what you're going to do about it. Uh, in my life, uh, it's been red velvet cake more than once, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. And when it happens to you and you, you make a mistake, you do something you just know somewhere inside yourself you probably shouldn't have done, uh, or you let an opportunity to do good go by and you didn't do anything about it. And you have that kind of sense, that kind of twisting feeling inside yourself and it gives you this dilemma. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you have this very strong impulse to get it off your chest, to clear the air, to go to somebody about it. And if you're like me, you have a contradictory impulse which says, no, cover it up. We live in an environment where it's very important to appear flawless and invulnerable, to not show any cracks in our veneer because our context in the East Bay is so competitive. You compete in life, you compete in jobs, you compete in relationships, and you have to be not necessarily tough-minded. You used to have to look tough, you have to look cool, and if you're not batting a thousand this week, if you've had a red velvet cake incident or more than one, then bringing that to the surface is a way of saying, well, I'm, I'm not really batting a thousand. Maybe I'm not as competitive as I want you to believe, and I can be taken advantage of because of that weakness. And so there's pretty strong social pressure not to do the kind of air clearing, getting off the chest kind of thing, and to just let the dilemma fester inside of us, and that, that twisting, that, that stress between those, those two impulses, that everybody has this uh, impulse to confess. It, it's, it's built into us, it, it's hardwired into us, and when we're living this, this dilemma uh, where I want to appear perfect, but I'm not actually on my inside, uh, it can just literally drive you crazy. Uh, my terrier has this impulse. Uh, he is a chronic offender. Uh, he's a sinner. He do, he's so bad. <laughs> he just does everything. He's, he's just bad. And he looks for opportunities to outmaneuver us, to take advantage of us, so he can be bad some more. <laughs> and what we've discovered is he is invulnerable to the concept of deterrence. There isn't enough punishment in the universe to make him straighten up and fly right because he loves being bad on the level of values. He's, he's committed to it, but when he is bad, we put him in a certain room because he values connection with you more than anything else, so we use isolation as his a sanction, and when we let him out of this room, he, he walks up to you with this expression, and he puts his little paws, he's only stands up at that height, he puts his little paws up on your leg, and he looks up in your eyes, and his little beady black eyes are just pleading with you. I'm so sorry. I, mean, I just I want to get this off. You say, oh, it's all right, Rick. It's all right. We're just going to go on. And he heads off to do the next bad thing. But he, he can't, he's got this inside of his little terrier heart someplace. It's, it's his natural. It's his, his go-to. Because like us, a conscience is hardwired into it. And a conscience is the thing that's your detection system that tells you, uh-oh, red velvet cake. And it's also the thing hardwired into us by God that launches countermeasures. The things that can help us get past that, to process it, because nobody bats a thousand. The, the book of James says, really simply, we all make many mistakes. It's just really plain. And I don't think there's anybody here, including myself, who couldn't say that that description is, is, is true of me, too. That hardwiring says to me that this ability is there for a really distinct reason. Our ability to confess is, if you will, the immune system of our spiritual life. It's what allows us to process the things that go wrong so that they don't destroy us. You know what? I don't get, take care of myself physically. I get sick. And it's because my immune system is weak, not because the germs are any stronger. And if I don't take care of myself spiritually, I can get sick that way too in my heart, in my soul, and in my relationships. And uh, darkness can start to feel a lot stronger than, than light all around me because I have no way to handle the past so it stays back in the past. If I don't take care of myself, I don't keep this healthy, 
I'm going to have profound troubles. If I do keep this healthy, I can survive almost anything because I have a way to get beyond it. That's what my terrier wants. That's what I want. And you know what? I think there's not a human being anywhere that doesn't want that to be true for them in a profound way. If I can't get beyond my past, beyond my red velvet cake moments, whether they were just today or whether they were 10 years ago, my history starts to feel like a weight, like a burden, rather than just like a memory. There are certain memories that we have, perhaps, of things that went wrong that we never really did process with the Lord, and those are the heavy spots in our mind and in our background, and we, we look for ways to lighten that load. Why did it take centuries for people to add wheels to suitcases? You know, we've had, I mean, the Egyptians were building the pyramids, and we have no wheeled suitcases. We, we've had wheels, we, we've had load-varying objects like suitcases for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and yet I remember the days when there were no wheels on anything, and to carry a large suitcase through an airport, you almost had to have the conditioning of an Olympic weightlifter, you know, the clean and jerk guys that throw those huge loads up on top of their shoulders, and they heave it up into the air and their, their legs are trembling and their, their knees are, are, are bowing out. It was like that, dragging your stuff around. You, you worked up a sweat just getting to your gate and someone uh, came along with the clever idea of we've put the little wheels down on the back corners of those. We can just pull them behind us and, it, and it's great. But neither system actually gets rid of the weight. It just changes how we experience it. You turn around and look, the suitcase is still there. And it's really easy to make it through life pulling your suitcase and thinking, you know, this is okay. It's not that heavy. It's not that heavy. I've got it on the wheels now. I can, I can, I can just pull it along. And, you know, the, I know the physics of it. The earth carries the weight, not me, and I just provide the momentum. It's, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Now, how we resolve that issue will determine the outcome of our whole spiritual life. Somewhere, sometime, we have to take that thing in the past and put it in the past. Confession will keep me healthy. It will keep the past where it belongs and it will give me the kind of perspective that I need to go forward. So this issue is really defining for faith because if, if, our, if we have a healthy concept of, of the red velvet cake moments of sin and confession that takes care of it, then we can process our life and we're going to stay in the right place and we're going to be able to continue to grow in our relationship with God and in our relationship with with other people. But without that, I'm not going to be able to survive very much. I'm going to start dragging around suitcases, hauling my baggage behind me, and eventually they're going to slow me down and bring me to a stop. Now the teachers and philosophers of the first century Roman Empire understood this, how critical this issue was. And so when new religion rolled into town, the people who said they followed a Palestinian carpenter named Jesus, the early Christians, when they showed up, they were a pretty significant threat to the religious system that was already in that situation in the colonial cities of the Roman Empire. And so they engaged the early Christians on this issue specifically because it was a place where you could attach to them, almost like a virus enters your body and looks for a place to attach itself to to sell so that it can set up a place to reproduce and to infect uh, additional areas and then spread to other people. And so these the existing uh, religious infrastructure of the day, the teachers and philosophers, found this particular vulnerability in the early Christian church and brought their ideas into it in order to shut down uh, what they were doing. And in response, the Holy Spirit led a man named John, probably Jesus' closest follower, to write a general letter to the early Christians as an, a vaccine for this virus that was being introduced from the outside. And here's what John writes in his first letter in chapter 1, verse 5, about this concept of how we deal with the red velvet cake moments. He says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his truth is not in us. When people are carrying weight, they go looking for ways to deal with it. Now, I'm a cyclist, and I am uh, one of several of the tribes of people who ride bicycles. There, there are tribes of us who are very different and often don't get along very well. My tribe is called the urban cyclist, or the vehicular cyclist, which means we ride uh, road bikes, but we wear blue jeans while we do it, and we go to work. We ride 5, 10, 12 miles a day, round trip, it's completely functional, it's to get to the place that we're going to do our work. We often have big saddlebags on the back, or at a minimum, a fancy a chrome messenger back slung, a bag slung over our back, uh, so that we can carry our laptop and all of our gear that we need to get to work. We work in the same clothes we cycle in, we do not shower at the other end, we do not take baths with baby wipes at the other end, which is what our colleagues in the road bike community do. And any of these other things, forget about it. We are functional. And so in my case, I'll ride about seven miles a day, uh, five or six days a week. And we're proud of our tradition. Blue jeans, helmets, flashing lights, dressed like circus clowns in, in, in high vis. Now, on the other hand, you have the road cyclists. These are people who appear in spandex. Uh, they fly through our city ignoring stoplights and stop signs on $12,000 bicycles built in France that weigh nine pounds. These are people who, in their mind, are riding in the Tour de France every day, even though it only happens in July, in another country. But when you're going 19 miles an hour and you've got $700 of spandex on and a $400 uh, lateral force protection helmet, uh, and no flashing lights, no bags, no blue jeans. The bike is completely stripped bare. The urban cyclists, our bikes are festooned with stuff. The road cyclists, not so much. You don't want anything on there. It's got to be absolutely pristine. Maybe a bottle of water and an energy bar to get me to the other end. And I'm going to be riding 40 miles rather than seven, but I'm going to do it all on Saturday. We do not get along always, these two tribes, but we do have this one thing in common. On lovely Sunday afternoons, you will find us all at REI. And we will be there for one purpose, looking for a way to make our bicycles lighter. Because in cycling, speed is weight. And so I'll often see people there who are from the road bike crowd, and what they're looking for is a $200 set of titanium pedals that will reduce their bicycle's weight by three grams. Now, if I could just get this, because the, the target they have in their mind is the tour riders on level ground on an average race day can achieve speeds of 35 miles per hour. I mean, it is unbelievable what these athletes are able to do. And in the mind of this road cyclist, if I could just get these titanium, they're, they're the ones that the guy who won the last leg is using my, my weight so much on me. I'd be screaming, I would be like a jet, ignoring all the stop signs and stoplights in the city of Berkeley as I fly on my 40 mile round trip. And I'm watching this person shopping for this $200 set of paddles, and I'm thinking, you know, you could just back off on the cheeseburgers. Yep. Because I think one cheeseburger probably weighs about <laughs> 10 grams, and if you had just skipped that last one before your ride, for, you would have saved $5 and gone at the same speed. So when I see a 200-pound man perched on top of a 12-pound French bicycle, I do not blame the bicycle. I blame In-N-Out Burger. Because if you were biking past that place, instead of biking through the drive through you wouldn't need to buy all of this fancy equipment. Does that make sense? We are always looking for a way to deal with the weight. And often the solutions we come up with are simple and wrong. They don't really work at all. So these false teachers have introduced a sense that there are easy, simple ways to avoid the weight that don't require you to come to terms with them. They have brought to us the titanium pedals. Now here's what John argues from this passage 
is a vaccine that will prove effective. And honestly, it will just make your life better. It, it just will. He does three things. The first thing he does is he tells the truth. He tells the truth about what these teachers are bringing to the church. If you look at the beginnings of verses 6, 8, and 10, you see the same phrase. If we say, if we say, if we say. He uses this formulation seven times in this short letter. And what he's doing is alluding to, or some scholars believe he's even quoting the words of these teachers who have brought this new idea in. And that new idea is very uh, simply summarized if we say we have no sin. And so the false teachers had a number of ways of telling people that there were easier ways to deal with the weight that they were dragging. They presented five different alternatives. One was the flat earth. This perspective says this concept of sin in principle doesn't exist at all, and anyone who argues for it is like people who represent the flat earth society. I mean, it's, it's nice, but come on, we all really know it's not. <laughs> it's not really that way out in the world. No one's ever fallen off the edge. The second philosophy they used, I, I call the Tyvek suit, that your body is an impenetrable suit that carries your spirit around, and because it's impenetrable, your soul and your body are completely disconnected from each other, and what happens in your body, nothing gets through to your soul. You're completely separate from the, any problem of contamination from the outside world, so just don't worry about this all stuff, all of this stuff, and listen to uh, my lectures. The third idea they bring is the bird's eye view, and this one says, uh, don't worry about the flat earth or the suit. The truth is, if you will follow my teachings, you will become so enlightened inside yourself that you will fly above moral categories like right and wrong like a bird. You'll be able to look down on them and see them, but they'll have no hold on you because you are on this plane up here where nothing from the earth can really touch you. The fourth group argued for rationality. If you're smart enough, you'll think rightly, and you will not fall into all of this stuff, especially if you avoid bodily pleasures of any kind and live a part of it. And the, and the, the fourth group, which is kind of a separate category, brought a pagan perspective, pagan in the technical sense, which said, right, wrong, sin, that's not really your problem. Your problem is how are you going to get power to solve the problems in your life? If you appease the God, the gods, they'll give you power, and you'll be able to achieve what you want to achieve in life if they feel like it. But in terms of a moral code, just pretty much follow what's popular and you won't have to worry. Now, all of these are mutations of the same kind of virus that attach themselves to the early Christian church and insinuate to people you can deal with this weight in your own way, in your own space, and your own time. Now, in one way, you see that influence in, in, in culture today. Uh, CNN reported a, a survey recently in which they asked Americans, uh, what are your favorite sins? And what they determined from the research was that the average person is so burned out from work that major big time sin with a capital S is not really a problem. Like, when was your last homicide? You know, it, did, it, it didn't happen. You don't really get up in the morning and think, I think I'll blow off work and rob a bank today. That's... That, that's that isn't you. That isn't us. People aren't, aren't really living that way. What they do believe are the things that are their red velvet cake moments are lifestyle issues. And so the top three temptations in which people fall into what they felt was some kind of sin, number one was procrastination. Yeah. Number two is eating too much. There's your in and out Burger guy. And number three is being overly, overly devoted to media which I think could be responsible for number one and number two. I'm not getting anything done because I'm spending all my time on social media while I eat in and out burgers. It could all be, you see, a, a, a sort of a package. So what's happening is people, people now believe that uh, right and wrong pretty much are subjective and, and uh, I can't really do anything about them anyway. I'm not going to do any of the heavy stuff. I mean, I'm not very likely to become an international counterfeiter or a terrorist or a, a criminal. So what I will do is I'll worry about the things I can control and what I can control is my media, my work, and my diet. And so I, eat, I will eat a gluten-free snack after I slap my girlfriend. 
And this leads us at the dilemma we mentioned at the beginning. I find myself in a Tyvek suit of relativism on the outside, while on the inside, I'm piling up suitcases and I've got no way to do anything about them. I, I, don't, know how to, I don't know how to get past them. I'm just dragging them behind me with no way to really do my laundry. John says you begin by saying what this idea really is. You begin by saying the truth. Then his second move is he calls them out. Verse 6 says, we lie and we do not practice the truth. Pants on fire. He, he directly contradicts these, this teaching that's coming in from the outside and says this is not really how it is. Look at what verse 8 says. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. That is God a liar. And his word is not in us. We deceive ourselves, essentially, John is saying, if we embrace any of these. Now, there's, there's no deception like self-deception. Uh, it's like a, a bad toupee. You're like, man, everybody knows. Really. I remember my Uncle Cal once came to a family wedding with his toupee on backwards. And he did not know that he had done it. And so the entire crowd is buzzing. Because when you saw him, it's like the part runs the wrong way around. And he's, he's going around, hi, how's everybody? Else? He thinks he looks great. But he's got his hair, is, his eyes are facing that way. His hair is facing that way. And he feels like he's, he's the head of the party. And he interprets the buzz as he's popular. But really what everybody's talking about is your hair's on backwards. Cool. Not really. It's just a toupee and everybody knows it. That's how self-deception works when I buy into something uh, that isn't really the case. I can get myself convinced that it's not really a thing. And John just calls him out. He says, no, this is, you're, you're going in a direction that leaves us all with nothing but baggage because there's no real way through personal enlightenment or any of these mental games to get rid of the weight that we're carrying. And then his third move, he offers hope. Verse 7 says, the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Uh, you know, it's not enough to contradict someone. I have to offer some loving, life-giving alternative. You see a lot of bashing go back and forth, especially on social media, but you very seldom see positive alternatives offered. That, in terms of just your social media conduct, that can set you apart. If you have some positive path to offer people, that can make a difference in your personal brand. John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Cleansing meaning the removal of the stain that sin leaves. You know that place at the airport where all of the lost baggage goes? You ever lost a bag while you're traveling? I have many times. It's an unhappy event. And you go to this sad little room, and there are all these orphan suitcases there. Sad looking, sagging little suitcases that have been, they've been lost in life. It's not easy to be an orphan of any kind, even when you're just luggage. And they're just, oh, the atmosphere. And so and the people who work there, it's so unhappy because you represent people's worst nightmare on an airplane, which is not having your suitcase arrive where, where you arrive, and, and there are racks and racks, and they're all black, and they all roll. They ask, well, what color is your suitcase? Come on. It's, oh, it's the black one. Oh, good. Yes, it's right here. We'll get that for you. When those suitcases are never recovered, they go to a place where the contents are sold. That's where lost suitcases end up. There are thousands of them collected in airports all across the United States that are wholesale to this place. And people can come in and buy stuff. Like they could buy your old cow t-shirt right out of your bag, your, your clothes, your laundry, your shaving kit, your best shoes, your brand new trainers, your hair care products, all your product, man. They can buy all of that stuff. And sometimes they'll even sell you a sight unseen, the suitcase without even showing you what's inside her. That's where your stuff goes when you lose it and you never see it again. When God separates you from your baggage, that's the same thing that happens. It's so far gone that even he says he doesn't remember it. It's cleansed and out of your life and the stain of it 
is removed. It's completely carried out of your existence, and there's no more rolling, no more lugging, no more 200 dog pounds. How do I confess? Let's use John's formula that he's given us in this passage today. First, I tell the truth. You don't always have to tell the truth to another person. Sometimes that's really unwise. But you can always tell the truth to the Lord. God, here's my red velvet cane. I'm not going to call it something that it isn't. I'm not going to try to perfume it up and make it smell better. It stinks. Here's my red velvet cane. I'm going to tell you the truth. Here's what happened to me. Here's that opportunity. I should have helped that guy and I didn't. Here's what I did, what I saw, what I said. And it stinks. I didn't just eat one piece or two. I ate the whole thing. Then I call it out. I characterize it. Lord, I know that's not what you have for me. I know that's not the sort of thing you want me to invest my time in. I, I, know, I know better than that. In fact, I am better than that. I should never have let that happen. I'm calling it out right now. I'm calling it my enemy, not my friend. I'm calling it something I don't ever want to be involved in again. I am turning my back on this right now. I'm calling it out. And then the third move is to reach for the hope. Lord, I'm going to ask you because of what Jesus has done on the cross to forgive me, not in some technical, legal sense, but will you just do my life? Will you wash me clean? Will you lift this stain up out of me? Will you take that suitcase from me and send it to that sad little room at the airport and then from there send it to that wholesale place and I will never see it again. Lord, we lift our hearts and lives up to you today. And God, as we worship your name, we ask you to give us grace to bring you all the suitcases in our lives, all the red velvet cake moments, and to receive cleansing and restoration today, not because of our words, but because you are faithful and just because of your character. We receive this from you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask if you'd stand with us for just a few moments, and we're going to enter back into a time of worship. And uh, as we do, this is a perfect time to, uh, you know, just roll those red velvet cakes right up to the Lord. He's not afraid or turned off or put off or, or distanced from you at all. He's especially close to us at those times, so we do need to confess it. Just in your heart and mind, if there's something that you, you just need to get off your chest today, uh, as we worship uh, for a few moments, this is a wonderful time to do that and just receive everything the Lord has for you, His grace and mercy and cleansing and uh this can be your sad little room at the airport today where you can leave that suitcase and never see it again. It'll just, it'll just be absolutely gone. So we'll begin to worship now, and as we do, just lift that up to the Lord. And if you'd like to have prayer, there'll be a few of us in the back uh, who'd be glad to pray with you uh, while we're having that time of worship.